I'm Peg Azarjus, Inclusion and Pro Bono Specialist here at the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association on behalf of the CMBA. We are so glad you are joining us here today. Uh, we are just going to wait as more of you who are uh, sitting and waiting are let into the room as we wanted to wait for a prompt uh, and sharp new start. I do want to thank our partners at the Norman S. Minor Bar Association. We will have today's discussion moderated by the president of the Norman S. Minor Bar, Delante Spencer Thomas. I want to thank our esteemed panel of guests here today. We have joining us Senator Sandra Williams. Uh, Senator Sandra Williams has an important meeting um, and so she will have to cut off a little bit earlier than the uh, slated end time for the CLE. So she just wanted to uh, let the audience uh, be aware of that in advance, but we are just so lucky to have her uh, here with us in any time that we can. And uh, I'd like to also introduce Danielle Sidnor, president of the Cleveland chapter of the NAACP. Thank you for being with us. And of course, Eddie Taylor of Taylor Oswald and on the county, uh, Cuyahoga County Citizens Advisory Council on Equity. I, I think it's an appropriate time, it's 12.03. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Awatif Assad. Awatif is the Vice President of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. She is the Chair of um, Inclusion and Diversity in that role as VP. She's been a litigator for 23 years with the City of Cleveland and most recently with Cuyahoga County. She is now the Director of Risk Management for Cuyahoga County and um, has spearheaded the first countywide anti-discrimination piece of legislation. Uh, as well as historic legislation providing LGBTQ plus protections, which was passed um, by the County Council in 2018. Owasif will be giving some opening remarks before Delante takes over as moderator. Owasif, thank you so much. Take it away. Thank you so much, Pega. Greetings, and thank you for joining us today. The CMBA is excited to collaborate with the Norman S. Minor Bar Association on this important discussion during Black History Month. We celebrate and honor the contributions and resiliency of Black Americans. We are excited for today's discussion with our esteemed panel on the steps governmental entities and leaders are taking to advance health equity. We look forward to taking what we learn here today back to our own organizations to help advance the cause of health equity. As a member of the Cuyahoga County Executive Branch and a Cuyahoga County resident, I am proud of Cuyahoga County for taking the lead. Not only is our county one of the first governmental entities to declare racism as a public health crisis, our county has implemented significant and concrete steps to eradicate racial disparities. It is well documented that racism affects health outcomes for black and brown Americans. Health disparities disproportionately affect black Americans. Cuyahoga County has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the country. Our future generations in the black community are at greatest risk. Stresses, stressors associated with discrimination and racism contribute to infant mortality. This is a sad reality. This is not happening in a third world country. It is happening here in our community. Trauma attributed to racism affects future generations. More work needs to be done to end the cycle of black trauma attributable to stress-induced discrimination. We must work together to dismantle the structures in place that perpetuate health disparities. Now more than ever, 
we must adopt practices, policies, and of course, legislation to build an equitable and inclusive culture. Our community's collective health depends on it. The CMBA looks forward to working with all of you as community partners to eradicate the impediments to inclusion and health equity. So let us begin. I am um, excited to introduce Delante Spencer Thomas. He is the president of the Norman S. Minor Bar Association. He is the Ethics and Education Council, Council for Cuyahoga County Agency of Inspector General. He provides exceptional ethic, ethics training across local entities, and I'm proud to consider him my colleague. Thank you so I, much. I did want to take a moment um, just to let everyone know that County Council President Purnell Jones has joined us as well. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Or, with Council you. President Jones. Delonte, so, take it away. My apologies. Thanks, Pega. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, we are super excited at, at the turnout for, for today's event. Um, and of course, thank you to, to all of our panelists for, for joining us. Um, you know, as we, you know, Watts have reached out and we thought about, hey, what can we do together for, you know, for Black History Month? And, and you know, what type of conversation can we have when we started thinking about, you know, just, just the health crisis, you know, that, that our communities are facing. And we thought about, hey, you know what, you know, Let's let's talk about what's going on with, with the declarations, right? You know, we, we've had these declarations. Let's figure out, you know, have a little bit more discussion about how these came to be, um, you know, from the community perspective, but also from from the legislative perspective. Um, but then also, you know, an update, right? Where where are we? Where are we going? What work still needs to be done? And so we thought this was a really important conversation to have, and we're glad that so many of you agreed. Um, so so that being said. Um, I will ask that you know each panelist introduce themselves, and then we'll we'll jump right in. Um, so first on on my screen is Senator Sandra Williams, and thank you again, Senator, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. I am State Senator Sandra Williams, and I represent the 21st Senate District of Ohio, which includes uh, Cleveland's east side, the west side, downtown Cleveland, the inner ring suburbs of Shaker Heights, Cleveland Heights, University Heights, Garfield Heights, Newburgh Heights, and Bratnall. Um, we're in the process of changing that right now. Um, but I look forward to the discussion on this panel. I also want to, again, just um, apologize for having to jump off this call early. We have a committee that was scheduled late last week and I need to be there. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Delante. Eddie Taylor, the owner of Taylor Oswald, the company headquartered downtown Cleveland, but also the current chairman of the Citizens Advisory Council on Equity case, as we refer to it, which is a, a county instituted organization. This, this equity um, panel, this equity council was constructed as a result of legislation previously enacted by Cuyahoga County and then stood up as an organization in the summer of 2020 in response to so much, of course, what was going on in the world. In addition, um, I am the current chairman of University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. So this perspective around health care and health care disparities certainly hits home in that capacity as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sidnor. Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Sidnor. I am the president of the Cleveland branch of the NAACP. Um, I was a member actually of the case committee with uh, Chairman Taylor, who is one of the folks leading the charge. Uh, from the county perspective, also set on the racism as a public health crisis working group that helped to bring the declaration uh, to the city of Cleveland. And so close to this work and really excited to have a chance to talk to you all about what's happened since and what we have to do as community to really ensure the declarations uh, become activated and we execute them together. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Council President Pernell Jones. Thank you, Delante, and again, thank you all just for the, the invitation to be here with you today. Again, I am County Council President Pernell Jones, Jr. Uh, I am a, a funeral director by profession, owner of the Pernell Jones and Sons Funeral Home, and I say my experience there has colored much of what I have 
have done here on council and, and those life experiences that I that I bring to the table. Uh, but as the council president, I have I am elected by uh, District Eight, the residents of District Eight, uh, which makes up the cities of Garfield Heights, Maple Heights, Newburgh Heights, Cuyahoga Heights, and the uh, south quadrant of the east side of the city of Cleveland. Uh, that those are the communities like uh, Mount Pleasant, the central neighborhood, and Slobby Village community in that southeast quadrant. And thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, so let's 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 jump right in. Um, you know, my first question is, you know, in in your own words, how do you define? Um, you know, racism as a public health crisis? Like, why is racism a public health crisis? Um, and we'll start, uh, Eddie, why don't we start with you on this one? Uh, the short answer for me in terms of the why is because uh, Black and Brown folks die disproportionately uh, to healthcare because of healthcare disparities. They are sicker and, and, and more ill in sort of uh, these same disproportionate ways. So it's a crisis because it continues to harm communities, it deters growth, it, it also limits uh, our abilities in so many ways as, as um, African-Americans. So the crisis part of it uh, is clear that unless we cure some of what ails us from a healthcare standpoint, uh, we will constantly see this erosion in terms of our ability to grow and, and prosper. So uh, the crisis part uh, has been known for a while. It's just great that the that it's been added to the agenda for so many organizations and elevated to such an extent that now action is being taken in more significant ways. Okay. Danielle, what about you? You know, I think the uh, thing that's always important to me when we're having these conversations is you can't cure something that you won't specifically name and identify. And I think about uh, any other health condition or any other issue, if I have cancer. I don't want someone to just treat my cancer. I want to know if I have colon cancer, that I'm dealing with a specialist who specializes in that particular treatment versus breast cancer. And so naming racism as a public health crisis gives us an opportunity to say we're talking about root cause systemic issues relative to race, as opposed to some of the generalizations that can happen when you start to identify issues relative to any kind of disparity. And so I think it's very important that by having a declaration that gets as specific to say, it is racism, that's the crisis, it now arms us with the ability to address issues that we know are uh, inextricably tied to race and not other issues. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, thank you, much appreciated. Um, Councilman Jones, I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts? You know, why, why is racism a public health crisis? It's a crisis just by the very definition of what racism is. It, it, it's a prejudice. It's a, the unconscious or sometimes conscious biases that people have. Uh, and, and these prejudices are, are multiplied by the power to act on them. And, and that to me is the definition of racism, a prejudice multiplied by power to act on it by individuals, by done collectively. They can be death by a thousand cuts. And again, it might not even be conscious, but, it, but it's there. And the outcomes of them are, are, are devastating to individuals and to a community. And, and I don't even like calling someone a racist because I, I, I don't need to call the name if I deal with the power that they're exerting. Uh, that, that, is, that is where I try to live and all that we do to push back on that power with everything that we do here that, that I'm capable and able and desire to do here at the county. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, thank you. Senator Williams. Sure. For me, uh, Senator uh, Herschel Craig out of Cincinnati, uh, Columbus, Ohio, and myself introduced racism as a public health crisis here in the state legislature. And for us, uh, it really boils down to the fact that the laws and the policies that have been put in place in our country's history, uh, which was meant to keep African Americans and other minorities inferior, uh, has contributed to racism as a public health crisis. And all that we do today, whether it's education, our prison system, our housing system, or our healthcare system. And although many of those policies have been eliminated on our books, still today, they are being replaced with current policies and laws that are continuing to keep us behind. 
Uh, they might not be as blatant as they were years ago, but we are still fighting that today. And until we get to the root cause, as Danielle said, about going to the systemic root of what took place, how it took place, and eradicating it, we're going to still continue to face the problems uh, that we have. And this is a long-term process, and it, it requires people to, I guess, accept the fact that these policies were in place and actually be willing to do something about it. No, and, and that's a good segue, you know, as we talk about policy and, and Danielle, you touched on this. So actually, I want to come back to you on this one. And, and also to, to all the panelists, feel free to jump in. We don't need to go <laughs> go, go in any specific order here. But, um, but you know, I'm interested to know why why a declaration was needed, right? Like, why, why specifically did we need to do this? What was the importance of it? You know, kind of what was it designed to do? Yeah, I think, you know, as Senator Williams uh, was just mentioning, the, this, the underlying things that sometimes we don't even recognize that we've inherited in our systems that make them, um, you know, have bias or where we see racism show up. Because when you start to think about issues in health outcomes and in quality of life and all of the things that we're talking about when you name something as a crisis, it's not always very evident that there is a specific policy or procedure uh, that has created the condition that we're in. But oftentimes, what we'll, or I, I know what we are seeing in this work, though, is when we take a moment to pause and kind of um, unpeel the onion and go all the way down the layers, you can identify very specific things like look at redlining in our communities. And if you overlay maps of when our federal government allowed people to disqualify folks, especially Black people, from being able to gain access to uh, mortgage lending, the same communities are facing issues of health inequity. The same communities are facing issues of uh, lack of access to high speed internet. And so there's a system in place that causes that to be, but many of us thought it just happened you know, by osmosis. So the declarations cause us to like unpeel the onion and find the root. And I think without it, we can go on treating symptoms without ever getting to the root cause of the problem. No, it's good. Um, <clears throat> you know, also interested in hearing. So, I can, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I can, I can add uh, to that just a little bit uh, for the legislature. Um, in order for us to look at the policies, we need to have uh, a law in place that mandates that it happens. A lot of times, we will put things out by telling people, "Hey, we want you to go and give African Americans companies 20 percent." of goods and services. It is a benchmark, but it's not mandatory. And when we go back and we look at that, we find that they didn't do it. And the first thing they say is that nobody mandated us to do it. You told us to use that as a benchmark. So for us, having this uh, policy in place in Ohio makes it mandatory that we start looking at all of our policies, our practices, our grant making, our uh, government incentives through the lens of racism and making sure that we have uh, something on the books that guarantees that it will be done. And every time we pass a law, every time we, uh, there's a committee called the Joint Committee on Agency Rules and Review that I sit on. And when each agency comes through, they have to periodically go back through all of the administrative rules that they have set based on the laws that we have passed. If we have the teeth of a resolution making racism a public health crisis and the teeth that says that you have to look at it with the impact on what it's going to have on African-American communities and African-American people, we then have the power to say, no, that policy will not go into place in Ohio until you tell us what the impact is going to be. And if it's negative, it gets bounced right back out. So for us, it means absolutely nothing if it's not in writing and not in the revised code. So what was the declaration designed to do? Why was it warranted? Danielle is right. It was forced exposure in so many ways, right? Peeling back those layers and exposing the underbelly of racism. But what it also did was it created a call to action for so many communities, hundreds across this country, hundreds of cities and counties and states and other organizations decided to join in this declaration. And because of that, these policies that the Senator has spoken of and so many other actions have taken place. So we've experienced these sorts of things, these 
kinds of crises or, or exposures previously, but because the call to action was made and others joined in and the conversation ballooned from there in the right way, I think that's what part of the design was, uh, for at least our purposes. And, and, and I agree that everything that's said is, is, is accurate. It's a clarion call to the community to say it, it is, this is an issue of concern and we need to address it. But also legislatively, as the Senator has said, it, it is the mechanism by which county government as an entity, as an institution, can now operate and begin to do the work it needs to do to address what has been uh, stated legislatively. All that we do, whether it's, it's housing, whether we, we rise from the battle of, of right to rent to, to rise into to right to home ownership and, and bringing the battle to the front lines of housing, uh, to, to health and human services, whatever the issue is, we have already stated at the top that racism is an issue. And now we can start to, to let that trickle downhill to all of the areas across the county government that we touch to determine what we need to address the front lines of racism across a, a, a wide spectrum of areas and disciplines. No, and, and Delante, can I just say this? I think for many of my colleagues here, especially in the Legislative Black Caucus, they wanted to really hear the words. They wanted to hear the words that in Ohio, we have racist policies and practices and we wanted people to admit it. And that caused a big problem here in the legislature because at our first hearing, it became explosive. Um, you might've heard the uh, conversation um, that happened in the first hearing that we had where one of my colleagues said that, is it true that um, uh, when our minority health director here in the state of Ohio was presenting on racism as a public health crisis, and he said, is it true that African-Americans get COVID more because they don't wash their hands? That was explosive. He lost his job as a doctor. He was in medical, uh, he's a medical doctor in the ER in an African-American community. Um, in the Dayton area. He teaches in medical school. He's a legislator here. And he also did not even believe that there were racist policies in our state. Not only did he not believe it, there are other legislators here who thought this was some type of joke to say they were responsible. They didn't even want to look down at the uh, the issue of racism, and they don't even want to have it taught or recognized in our state. So we have some big problems that we have to address. So many of our members just wanted them to admit that their forefathers had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. Senator, let me ask you this. What's the status of the, of the resolution at the state level? Well, at that, after that hearing, we have never received another hearing. Uh, once the uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the legislator, the physician was terminated. Not only did the chair of the healthcare committee, which the bill was in front of, decide not to have another hearing, uh, they basically wouldn't even schedule a hearing, wouldn't hear testimony, wouldn't let written testimony be submitted on the issue. And they tell me that they did not want to take uh, any further steps on this issue because many of the legislators who are not African-American believes that their livelihoods would be at risk. Um, what happened in Dayton, Ohio, according to uh, the newspapers is that that Senator who may ask the question received threats. Uh, his family received threats. His family had to move out of town uh, because of the question that he asked. So no other legislator here wants to get that type of pressure or lose their jobs. And uh, we just didn't have anything. Now, this is the second General Assembly that we introduced this legislation. The chair of the committee is the man who asked the question, uh, the Senator who asked the question who lost his job. So he came into my office and he said, Sandra, why don't you get the president of the Senate to move that bill out of my committee? Because you will not get those people to come into my committee and behave the way they behave in the last General Assembly. And of course, it did not move. So the status is we haven't even received a first hearing and we're 10 months out from the end of this General Assembly. Wow, wow. Um, you know, and that, that makes me wanna go, go back to Danielle and Eddie on this. Um, you know, what, what does community support look like, right? Like how, 
um, you know, how does the community come together to, to push or to advocate something like this? You know, I think that um, it's unfortunate that we are in a place now where uh, when, when things happen, we don't have an opportunity to, to have those conversations in a way that sometimes can be meaningful. And every single thing that happens now is caught up in a 24 hour, you know, news cycle and, and, and these things. I mean, I think I remember uh, Senator Williams when the question was asked about, you know, do African Americans get COVID because they don't wash their hands? And so it's a very ignorant comment, right? And, and we know that. And we know that someone who is a medical professional that could have that kind of belief likely would not believe me as a Black woman if I say I'm in pain and I need someone to investigate what's going on. And so what I think that we have an opportunity to do when any of these situations arise is have a chance to learn and to talk. And it's frustrating to me that when we get to the place of thinking about how does the community come into these conversations is rather than folks shying away and running away from the conversation, to me, these present great opportunities to lean in. You know, maybe the formats and the places that we do that don't always have to be immediately in the public eye. I think about these types of forums where there's somebody on today that's listening that's gonna be able to go back and take some information into a conversation that I will never be a part of, but they're gonna take some nugget today. And so community participation, in my opinion, shows up in multiple ways. Yes, sometimes it's our leaders, it's our elected officials coming together and have conversations. And then it's also grassroots, us just being able to dig into these things one-on-one, -on -one, share our experiences, being able to identify areas that we feel like we can make progress in together. And without a formal structure, going to our you know, hospital systems and others and saying, we're patrons. These are the things that we're experiencing or, or our city services or our county services. This is what we're experiencing. And this is what we think needs to change. So I feel like community should be involved in all levels of the conversation. And I couldn't agree with uh, Danielle anymore. And certainly the best conversations are the ones she's mentioned. Those that start at the grassroots level and bubble up uh, to a place where the sort of changes and, and improvements can be made. And the Citizens Advisory Council is also an example. And this, this example is repeated elsewhere where the community can get involved. 17 folks were approved by County Council. Thank you, uh, Council President Jones and uh, Congresswoman uh, Brown, who was a part of this process early on. Uh, for saying yes to those 17 individuals, clergy, business leaders, business owners, volunteers in this community who had the voice of the community, created a report at the end of 2020, which was responsive, responsive in terms of what we heard from the community because we had lots of dialogue. We invited the community into that dialogue, those community conversations where they expressed their own up close and personal um, episodes of, of racism talked about ways to improve. We've gotten the youth involved along the way. So that community dialogue, inviting the community into the conversation at every step along the way is an important part of what CASE does. And I'd say it would be an important part of any effort to make certain that we hear voices from all sectors, those who feel strongly, not as strong, or those who might even disagree with this declaration, but it's important that the community have a voice in the process at every level. No, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and as we talk about the declaration and, and, and Councilman Jones, I want to come to you on this, um, you know, with the county, you know, seeing through the declaration, um, you know, if you can start to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what that process looks like, right? Like how, how does the declaration come to be? What are the steps that, that were taken? How does this kind of get up the ladder until, until this is executed? If you're asking how we declared, declared as racism? Uh, the, the mechanics of it, it started with our colleague, my colleague at the time, Councilwoman Chantel Brown. She, uh, this was her, she was the primary sponsor. And, and with her efforts, uh, we all were co-sponsors and it became a de declaration from that moment. Uh, so if that, was that your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, walking through some of those steps, I mean, were there approvals, were there, you know, meeting conversations that needed to happen, you know, what, what takes it from an idea to something that's actually on paper and presented to the public? Got you. Well, definitely it was her idea. Uh, it was drafted. It, the legislation was, was brainstormed for the language. And uh, we certainly looked at other communities, the things that they had stated, tried to draw from them, glean from them, anything that we felt we needed and added what we felt was necessary for our community. 
and, and that is how it was created. And the 11 council members voted to, uh, again, make it uh, uh, an, an ordinance here at the county. Now, that was the nuts and bolts of how we, we uh, introduced our a piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, let's say if, if I could jump in because I think it's it's interesting uh, from the city's perspective, as opposed to it being something that was totally generated by uh, council individually. You did have community organizations. It really started with the United I mean, the um, YWCA when they were doing the 400 years of racism, and also um, Urban League of Greater Cleveland, and then this kind of coalition was really built around having the city consider introducing this legislation. And so the working group really kind of went around and, and identified other communities that had uh, legislation already around racism as a public health crisis. And we were doing the work before the murder of George Floyd and actually the pandemic is one of the things that stopped the uh, Cleveland City Council from being able to formally make the declaration prior. And so I think it's important as we're, we're having these different conversations because you, some communities are uh, now kind of making declarations and not even just communities, you have organizations, you have boards that are serving people that are also making these declarations and really uh, understanding the, the difference when there is community involvement on the front end of being able to help come together uh, with the legislation. I think when you asked that question before about what does community involvement look like, I think there's multiple ways that in, in certain communities where the community has been a part of the process from the very beginning. Uh, and there are other situations where it is our elected officials that are stepping up. And so I think this hybrid approach of how leaders are bringing these declarations to their communities, in my opinion, really gives us some uh, great examples that we can continue to use for other cities that haven't gotten there yet, because we still got a whole lot more work to do nationally around communities feeling comfortable and even in our own state, you know, making the declaration. And I will say from the state perspective, we, um, the members, the African-American members of the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus belong to a national organization called the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. And the NBCSL actually passed a resolution a few years ago and asked uh, their members to come back to the states and push this type of resolution. At that time, it was uh, former representative Stephanie House and Erica Crowley in the House of Representatives who spearheaded it in the House and in the Senate. And our process is really just having the legislation drafted, getting it introduced and assigned to a committee and going through that committee process, which is um, easy. The hard part is getting a hearing and getting the legislation through. So that is how our process began. And I will say for community engagement. I think one thing that's very important, you know, the state of Ohio gives out billions of dollars in forgivable loans to companies who want to do business in the state of Ohio. And we also uh, give out a lot of grants. So I believe one of the ways we can increase community engagement is requiring those organizations who are receiving money from taxpayers in the state to have some type of um, um, racial course that they're teaching members of not only their board, um, their um, executive team, as well as flowing it down to the employees so that they can recognize some of the things that African Americans have been through in our lifetime and making sure they know ways that they can counter that in the workplace. Because African Americans sometimes face racism in the workplace and there should be a way for not only them to report that problem, but a way to address it that is uh, recognized by that particular agency and then begin to root it out. So I think these private sector companies have a role to play in us dismantling racism. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat I want to get to because they're kind of, you know, in, in the same realm before, before I switch gears. Um, so one question is, how do we encourage white allyship to help in this crisis? or whomever may want to take that? Well, I would say, um, one, the recognizing how important it is for all of us and not just um, for the African-American community. I I'll give you one county example. Uh, we, we had a contract of $30 million to COVID proof our, our county buildings, put up the plastic shields, the signage and all of those things. 
It was a $30 million contract. Well, the winners of the contract were four of the largest companies, uh, construction companies in the world. They revenues of billions of dollars annually. And they were given, they won minor work. That, again, that is putting signs on the wall, putting plastic between stations. Again, not, not something of major companies like this certainly could do, but they weren't the only ones who could do it. But when the bids went out, it was systemic because the, the template that was used for scoring had one of the, the largest qualifications was how qualified your company was. 40% of the points went to how strong your company was. Well, there was no one who could outcompete billion dollar revenue companies. So they won the majority of the points and won the contract. There were no minority participation and there were no smaller companies, regardless of color, who could have won that contract. It went to all of the larger companies. So when we saw that, they said, well, this is, this is racism, maybe not conscious, but you pulled out a template for scoring that's been in the box for 50 years. You used it to, to score and the larger companies won it. So we went back and we redid the contract. We needed to work, so we gave $15 million to that contract, but we took the other 15 and we rebid it. We changed the systemic approach that we used to scoring. And that way that allowed other companies, minority, smaller companies, white owned companies, local co companies to win and spread that, month, that, that contract around over the uh, tax paying companies of right here in Cuyahoga County. And as a result, everyone was happy. The unions were satisfied, the small business contractors. I even had one large company say, well, you know, we, we're really glad you rebid it. You know, we kind of felt a little embarrassed just because we won. Uh, so so it, it gave us a template for how you go back and recognize the racism at its root, which started not with the individual, but just with the template that was used for how you score. We rooted it out at the systemic level, which was just a, a, a scoring template in a, in a box in the corner somewhere. By changing that, we changed the whole dynamic of how we, uh, how we did things. So it's not just an individual, it's a system. And you have to go back and learn the origins of the system. And with that, you'll learn, you'll see how you can change. And that's what we did. And that's what we want to continue to do, again, under this declaration. Thank you. The allyship question is an important one for a few reasons. And first of all, I would say I've been heartened through this process uh, with CASE in particular, that that allyship has come in a number of different forms. We have you know, at one point Rabbi Josh Caruso, uh, who was on the CASE board, Dr. Heidi Gullett, who uh, of course is a physician and does this work for the county and, and health institutions in town and others who were non-African American, non-folks of color, who were part of this advisory council. But what it, what's happened over the course of time, we've heard from ally groups, Southeast, and Southeast Asian groups, we've heard from other groups, including uh, folks who are, who are white. The point is, these are thoughtful conversations that we're having. And if you wanna be engaged in these thoughtful conversations to create that allyship, it's a, it's a big tent, right? We are inviting everyone to come in and have these conversations, which are the right conversations in order to affect the sort of change that we're all after. So I, we encourage uh, overwhelmingly, abundantly, that allyship and would want folks who are interested in seeing what's right done to, to sort of join in these discussions and create the outcomes that we all seek. No, thank you, thank you. And um, I think that uh, we can encourage participation, um, kind of like Eddie said, by just having dialogue with people who just don't know and don't understand. Um, after the situation from our first hearing with my colleague that um, you know, made the statement, I had another colleague call me. He said, would you please have uh, coffee with me? So we went and we had coffee and we talked and he said, Sandra, I just don't understand what you, what, what you all mean. I don't understand how you, how, why you wanna say racism is a public health crisis. Can you break this down for me? Because I truly don't understand. So we spent about two hours with me explaining to him what we meant by racism as a public health crisis. And I also gave him examples of things that are taking place today 
uh, that we are looking at in the legislature and how racist practice has contributed to that. And, you know, maybe some people said, well, he's a liar. He has to understand. He, he knows history. He's a very smart, wealthy man, but maybe he doesn't know. And so I think it's our responsibility to not try to force it down somebody's throat to say, you know it, accept it, and do something about it, but explaining it to them from your standpoint and then giving them sound examples of how those practices are seen today. And one very easy one is if you come from downtown Cleveland at the baseball stadium, if you ride right up the street, you can see the result of these past racist practices in Buckeye, Kinsman Union, and other places. When you see people who are undereducated and uneducated, and you're wondering why you're throwing billions of dollars at the educational system in our, in our community, then you should see why. Because the underlying policies and practices that have been in place, and maybe the folks who are in the school system, running the school system, or what you teaching may be contributing to what we're seeing today. So if we can resolve some of the basic stuff that we're doing right now, maybe we can get ourselves together. But you have, I think you have to have that conversation with people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Monte, I, I've been asked to clarify <laughs> what case is. And when we first oh, okay. refer to case, it's the Citizens Advisory Council on Equity. I, I know the confusion is an easy one to make with the university, but that's not the case. And saying Citizens Advisory Council on Equity doesn't roll off your tongue. And to pronounce it KC <laughs> doesn't do it justice. So we shortened it or made it easier to, to, to relate to by calling it case. So folks who um, may be a little confused, it has nothing to do with the, the university. This is really the, the acronym that we use, that the, the pronunciation of the acronym we use for this advisory council. No, thanks for clarifying. I actually thought that for, for a second myself. I, I also work at Case. I'm like, what are we doing at Case? <laughs> I thought that as well. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Mr. Taylor, for clarifying. Um, you know, and, and I, I want to get to this question, too, that, that came up in the chat, um, you know, particularly before, before Senator Williams has to leave us. Um, the question is, how does the Ohio Minority Health Strike Force report uh, calling racism a public health crisis, which uh, Governor DeWine endorsed, um, how does that affect this issue in Ohio? Um, if, if, you know, Senator, or if any of you, you know, can speak to that. Well, first of all, I want to thank the governor for actually doing it. And it took a lot of work for it to get to, um, to the place that it did. I think having the right people in place on the board like we did this time um, was a great start. But as with everything we do here in the legislature or in the state, uh, the proof is in the pudding. We have a lot of uh, reports that are sitting on our desk that go absolutely nowhere. And it's good to do a report, but if you don't implement the report, if you don't go through and take the recommendations to heart and make sure that everybody under his control is implementing them or going through the procedures, then you're not gonna get anywhere. And at one point I had gotten a call from somebody anonymously saying that they were putting people in place on some of these boards to look at uh, on the strike force board that really were not actually going in depth to do the job that they were supposed to be doing. They were basically there as a placeholder and to say certain things was taking place and it really wasn't. So I think having a committed person in place who's gonna carry out the recommendations of the strike force and not just doing it as a one-time thing, but continuing uh, the practice. It shouldn't stop because COVID is over. And all of a sudden now we, you know, we're getting over COVID and nobody's thinking about these practices anymore. It has to be long-term. Mm -hmm. You know, as we talk about, you know, this, this calling racism a public health crisis, um, you know, there's another question in the chat too that I think is, is, is one to think about. Uh, is racism a public health crisis or the social determinants of or that lead to racism um, that creates the public health crisis? Can you repeat that? Yes. <laughs> okay, so so is racism a public health crisis like just itself or is it the, the social determinants of racism that creates health crises? I think the social determinants 
uh, I mean, the, the social determinants also come from racism. And so it's, it's having to acknowledge that that is the root. Racism causes the social determinants of health that we, we talk about. So a uh, number of times the statistic is often given about the life expectancy of someone that lives in you know, the Huff community versus Lyndhurst. So you can't say it's just based on just where you live, but it's racism that causes us to have redlining that likely meant that people ended up living in Huff and that they also went to a school that provided them with a a less than quality education that meant that they also had less likelihood to obtain a job that puts them in a position to have the, dis the disposable income to buy high quality fruits and vegetables. They likely don't have a grocery store, all those things. So those things are the social determinants of health, but at the root of it is racism that causes the conditions that uh, materialize in our social conditions. I would agree with that. And I would all, I would just use the example of minimum wage. I mean, you know, we have a minimum wage of about $8. And some employers are paying people $8. And you want that $8 worker to go and to take care of themselves and their family members. Now, with the cost of rent, the cost of buying food and everything else, what do you think that person is gonna do? They might not be able to afford a quality home to stay in. They might be living in a place where a landlord is providing subpar uh, living arrangements. They don't eat quality food. And all of these things contribute to how they are able to live in their community, have a productive life and uh, live in society. We're starting and it starts with state law. State law says you don't have to pay them anything. You, don't, you can pay them what you think they're worth. And the employer says, I think you were $8 and I want you to do this hard labor. And that $8 is not allowing you to put your family in a school system where they will get a quality educational system. They're not allowing you to live in a, in a house that is healthy. It might have lead in it and we're trying to eradicate lead right now. You're looking at, can I pay the medical bill? If I can't pay the medical bill, I'm not going to the doctor. In many cases, and this used to happen a lot, where the hospital will turn you around because you had a bill. So you're not even going, you don't have the ability to take care of your health care. And this system goes on and on and on. And it's all based on racist policies that are in place. And can I respond to something that Senator Williams said? Because I think the other part of um, sometimes kind of uh, wrapping our heads around these things that feel a little bit abstract is like racism is a public health crisis. We could very easily identify that like COVID-19 is a public health crisis because we see people physically sick and we identify that if not, but for COVID, they wouldn't be sick. And so really, how, how do we identify that, but for racism, Delante, who has a law degree, would also be doing this other thing, but racism says, with his qualifications, he's relegated to certain jobs. And if we go back into the beginning of, you know, how, how we kind of organize, organize ourselves as community, one of the founders of the Cleveland branch of the NAACP was a law grad from Brown University. And the only job that he could get at the time was at the post office. And there's nothing wrong with working at the post office, but how many people go to school to get a law degree to work at the post office? People don't do that. That's not why you go to school to get a law degree. And so, Racism uh, is what caused him to be unable to be able to get a job in his field. So that means his family doesn't have the wages that he could have. His family doesn't have the land in the future. And so I think that's when we're talking about this, this is not only from how it shows up in our health outcomes, it is literally saying as a condition of our community, uh, but for racism, we would have a different outcome collectively together. And if we want to have more opportunities, it's not a zero sum game. It's not saying that, you know, uh, white folks lose if black folks and, and other communities of color start to have more equitable access. We actually all benefit together, but we can't do that if we don't deal with these root cause issues. Mm -hmm. And again, I repeat myself, racism is power. It's power colored by, by prejudice. And, and we have to resist that power. Uh, it, it, it's devilish, it's insidious. And, and your solution is, is to, to acknowledge it, recognize it, resist it, and speak truth to it. Speak truth to this power. That, that is how you do it. Whether it's a, the doctor you mentioned who had a, had a prejudice, uh, you, you acknowledge it. I don't necessarily condemn the person, but I want to know that their actions are not appropriate. 
and, and you respond to it. Or maybe that person can be educated. Sometimes they cannot be educated, but you have to speak to it and either that person is sidelined or that person is changed. Systemically, the same thing. You have to acknowledge it. You have to recognize it. You have to resist it. And then you speak truth to it. And we, and we change a $30 million contract. It's individual and, it, and it's systemic, but we have to recognize it, resist it, and then just, just speak truth to it. That is how we change it. Our, our, our country, sadly, has been built on one of these pillars of, of racism and, and capitalism, of just one of the pillars of this country. But we can move beyond it. We can grow beyond it and, and we can defeat it, but it means working together. And as, as Daniel said, this, this myth that whites will lose if blacks gain, it is, it is a myth. It is a lie. We benefit. There is, there is an intersection of, of capitalism and, and racism. Again, I, I'll come back to that $30 million contract. There was an intersection of capitalism and racism just in that contract. And because of the su success we had there, everyone was happy. Everyone ate. The unions, the, the, the big businesses, the small businesses, the workforce, everyone was happy. That is the end result. That is what we're working to get to. And, and, and that, is, that, that is what it will look like across all of the spectrum where racism touches. If we stay together and fight and push together to get to that other side. Mm -hmm. There's a comment in the chat that says the post office worker story does not only result in, in less wealth, but the stress from frustration, shame, humiliation that, that comes from being treated unfairly, you know, are things that, that make people sick, physically sick, and even mentally ill, which, which I think is a, is a really good point as well, going to, to Danielle's point, um, and how this, this you know, domino effect, um, you know, happens. Ante, some, someone asked in the chat if this is the declaration has worked in other places. I've been on panels um, in this role with folks from across the country talking about their declaration, Milwaukee and so many other places where they were, you know, sort of one of the first to make these declarations. It has worked. It is, has been quantifiable in some ways. It, it's never urgent enough. It's never effective enough. And we can always do more, right? But if if, as we think about our own situation here with the Citizens Advisory Council, it led to the county executive producing two, perhaps three executive orders that dealt with things around a disparity study that was also being conducted at the time. It led to the creation of a new office within the county executive's purview that deals with diversity, equity, and so many more meaningful ways within the county, doing the training around DEI. It, it led to this council uh, opposing legislation within the state around 320, 327 and 322, I believe, around um, what could be taught in schools, right? The suppression of, of systemic racism as a concept, as a, as a thought in schools. We wrote to our elected officials and talked through our opposition. So many things. While we have no regulatory approval or ability or or any oversight, we certainly are citizens and we speak our minds as business owners and leaders in the community and clergy and others, as I mentioned. So that work, again, never going to be enough in isolation, but that work I think has led to just like the $30 million contract example to um, some level of change. We just need more folks involved. Yeah, Eddie, you talked about, you know, kind of, you know, what's happening in, in other places. Um, you know, I, I want to come back to you on this about, you know, what are your thoughts about some of the challenges, um, you know, on, on getting things like this pushed through, whether it's declarations, legislations, policies, et cetera, um, you know, from, from a citizen's, you know, side of things, but also, you know, being intimately involved in, in some of these, these policy conversations. Um, you know, what have been some of the challenges in, in you know, having the conversations or, or getting things pushed through? Uh, the, the challenges are almost always time and apathy, right? With, over time, the, the urgency of a pandemic, the urgency of a murder being committed, you know, as we could see it on, on tape, uh, those things, once again, spur people to action. So uh, over time, folks move on and, and they get immersed in their everyday lives and that apathy also takes hold. We just can't allow that to happen. As I say, uh, with respect to the hospital board I'm on, we always have to keep on the agenda 
every single discussion, every single meeting, this notion of disparity in the healthcare outcomes, folks who are black and brown, we have to maintain it as an agenda item. We're not gonna allow, allow apathy to set in. So that really, for me, those are the challenges because goodwill people wanna do what's right. And you're hearing that from the folks on this panel. I imagine those are folks who are in the audience right now. It's just, we've got to find a way to make it, to, to maintain that level of concern and urgency. Mm -hmm. um, and, any other thoughts in terms of challenges, roadblocks to, you know, pushing, pushing this forward? I think the, the, the biggest thing that uh, continues to resonate with me is something, the same thing that Senator Williams said in her conversation uh, with her colleague is that there's just a significant lack of understanding. Uh, how do you how do you wrap your arms around this thing that's so big that just again seems to be invisible to many folks who are not experiencing racism and navigating it on a daily basis? We don't have colored drinking fountains and whites only drinking fountains anymore, so people don't see the very visible things sometimes, and it, it makes it seem as if uh, we're searching for a problem that doesn't exist when in reality. The problems just went away publicly in some spaces and they uh, went more into systems and we see new rules being created similar to uh, what Eddie talked about in terms of this push against the mythical critical race theory that is not actually taught in schools anywhere, which has now opened a new systemic issue because fact and truth is being attacked and I've shared this with some of our um, Jewish brothers and sisters that we're seeing it now happen. Initially, it came as an attack against talking about the experiences of Black people, but we're seeing now books that are talking about the Holocaust and other uh, things that are just factually true in our history that have taken place, that, that there's attempts to try and uh, minimize that information from being shared and spread. And so we have to recognize that when we talk about racism as a public health crisis, it does feel very, again, ambiguous for a lot of people. And we have to spend time having these kind of forums and conversations to really unpack what it really means and arm people with good information to go back into the spaces that they occupy to be advocates for why these types of declarations are necessary and, and what we have to do to rid ourselves of the issues of the past, but prevent new policies from being put in place that also have racial and racist undertones. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, getting to the root cause, speaking truth, informing people, um, touching the hearts and minds of indi individuals, that's what it's going to take with racism, to combat racism, to declare it. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we made Juneteenth, about a year ago, uh, Juneteenth, an uh, official holiday here at the county, and then within a week, the, uh, the president, uh, Biden, uh, made the same declaration. So and we did it uh, maybe a week before. But just that opportunity to just to speak about Juneteenth and, and, and how the, the last of, of the slaves were, were freed from Galveston, Texas uh, back in 1865. I, I, attended, I, I visited the African American Museum in Washington, DC. They had an exhibit on the Ku Klux Klan and it said that they were started in 1865 as well. So to want to understand just like that $30 million contract, to understand that the system started with a scoring card to understand that what we're dealing with can go back to at least 1865 and, and a, a North and a South that found themselves in civil war, a, a South that, that fought to keep slavery, that saw racism, saw a race as being supreme over another race and, and the North fighting this and winning, but still trying to hold the union together. But that South having lost, years later, they, they, would, they would want to, again, have the South rise again to have uh, to, to, to build statues. The losing side would build statues of Grant and others in the in the decades to come. When the losing side doesn't get that opportunity, you, you have to go back to the roots and 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 then see how it has impacted us today. And, and those philosophies and supremacy beliefs and all of those things have uh, trickled down to the day. They 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 wanted to make America great again back then. And, and we see it today. We've seen it in the TV shows of the 70s of, of Archie Bunker 
singing, singing songs as opening credits. Those were the days. Romanticizing those days of the past. It's with us. It, it's woven into our society in a way that we don't even see it. It's just hidden. It's, it's systemic. It's all around. It's in the, in the atmosphere. But when you do see it, you just simply resist it. And, and you speak truth to others. And, and not trying to destroy another person, but, but trying to educate them and, and hopefully they will change. So that again, we when it's all said and done, we're, we're walking hand in hand together. Uh, and and but again, I just see you have to be able to see the, uh, see as much as you're able to see of the big picture and just resist it when the time comes. And and as elected officials, we have to to do what we can. But we put our hands on. Uh, I, I deal with. I try to see a bigger picture, but I I focus on what I can red light and green light it with the authority I've been given. And 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 that that's the approach that I take. Mm -hmm. Delonte, if I can say uh, a couple of things before I uh, get off the uh, sure. panel, I would say this. There are African-Americans in our communities who actually don't want to even talk about racism and racist practices. And there are some people who believe that uh, those individuals who are suffering in our society are suffering uh, because uh, of their own doing. And so... Uh, we have people within our own community, people who have made it, some people who have not made it and just believe that this is not something that we need to be bringing up in, in 2022 um, as a policy initiative and that we need to move on and get over it. Um, I've had conversations with people about this all the time. So I think we as a society need to start having conversations with our own African-American brothers and sisters and explaining to them why it's important because many of them are pushing it off. That's one thing. And I always tell people who are upset about uh, real black history being taught in our public school system that, you know, if they don't do it for us, we have to do it for ourselves. Nobody's gonna do anything for you until uh, we step up in this country and begin to tell the truth about what happened to African-Americans in our history, then we need to educate ourselves and start teaching it to our children and our nieces and nephews and everybody else so that they are aware and that they are marching with good information um, in their lifetime, when they're in college, when they're in high school and asking the right questions. So they might not be teaching it, but if we teach our young people about what happened, they can begin to uh, uh, ask the questions and challenge what's being said in the classroom based on the information they're given um, in our school system. So maybe we need to figure out a different way to skin the cat, you know, instead of just uh, attacking it from one angle. But we have to address what we have in our own backyard about our own people wanting to address the issue or accept the issue um, that's happening and think it's, a, it's our own fault. It's the other person's fault that they're living in the conditions and it's my responsibility to move away from them because they chose to live this way. Nobody chose to live in the conditions that we all talked about on this call today. Nobody woke up saying, I wanna be broke, hungry, uh, live with a, uh, my roof open, my porch falling in. I just didn't wake up thinking this way. Something happened in the system that failed and it's our responsibility to get it right. And so I just want to thank you all for having me. I have to get over to the power siding board and um, please invite me back anytime. This was great. Hey, Senator, thank you so much. We appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, Alante, can I, can I address the, a question in the chat around? Yeah, I was, I, was, I was actually just about to bring so that up. On Monday of this week, we had our, our Citizens Advisory Council monthly meeting at the county headquarters. And we invited the Adams board representatives in to speak to us because of this, this verbiage change. Um, and Adams board is doing wonderful things. I, I have to first say that what it does from a behavioral standpoint in our community to disadvantage or disadvantage the disadvantaged population is wonderful. The quote that was offered by the chair was anthropologically and biologically, there's only one race. That's the human race on the face of the earth. We're attempting to change the narrative from fighting racism, which is, a, which is a losing battle, if there's only one race. While logically that may make sense to some, um, parsing words in this way is harmful. And in our view, as a council, 
hurtful. It doesn't help. Racism and discrimination are different things. They are components of and connected, all those things we recognize. But to soften it, to lessen it by using the word discrimination over racism doesn't do justice to or and what for what ails us. So we have voiced our opposition. We will speak again because we support the work of the Adams Board. But that change, in our view, my view, doesn't help. There's also a comment in the chat that these are sort of conversations that are you know, we've tried over before, nothing new. That may be true on some level. So give us something new to talk about for those who have a suspicion or an apprehension or just don't quite understand why we keep having these kinds of conversations. Let's talk through what more can be done because what you may find is there's a lot being done behind the scenes. It just it doesn't all get talked about in a setting like this. So. You know, and Eddie, I think, um, you know, uh, the NAACP, our first vice president, Will Tarter, provided some written testimony uh, uh, for, for a case for that meeting around the particular language change from racism to discrimination. And we share the same sentiment that um, discrimination is not specific enough to really get at the root of what we're talking about because discrimination is an actual activity. When you're saying racism is a public health crisis, then you're saying, again, you know, you have policies and procedures and things that happen that someone is not necessarily uh, doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but inherently in the system itself, there's racism that's built in that caused those things to happen. So that's why, I mean, I, to uh, James's question specifically, we felt that it was very important to say, no, it's not discrimination, but it is racism. And then to have this alignment with the declaration the county and, and others have made. And I would even add to the, the comment about, you know, um, we continue to have these discussions and these conversations, but literally these types of forums do help us to be able to say, there's somebody who's on this call or was on that watch the case call or whatever that doesn't know that after these conversations, the Adams board yesterday actually rescinded the change from uh, discrimination and replaced it back with racism. And so is does that have any value or meaning? I believe that it does because now they know as a group that folks are continuing to watch and to pay attention. And so we have to communicate the same message you know, 20 something times before it sinks in uh, to an audience, just like anything else you do in marketing or business. And when we're addressing these issues as community leaders, it feels like you're beating a dead horse, but you can't have the conversation enough. This is not the only avenue that we're using. It is simply one of them. And there are conversations happening behind closed doors. It's empowering people inside of organizations to push back on leadership, to make them and help them make decisions that are more equitable. And so please take this information and go use it. And again, whatever space you occupy, I always say we have an obligation to be better advocates and we should be using these kind of forums to take information, to go back and not just say, oh, I attended something at lunch today, but what are you gonna do with the information that you hear in whatever organizations you're affiliated with? Yeah, Daniel, I think you're spot on. You know, I think, uh, and, and admittedly, I, I'm just hearing for the first time that that this happened within the Adams Board, right? Um, you know, and and it, and it's a you know these types of things are a potential threat, right? When it, if there are you know groups, communities, you know bodies, et cetera, that are looking to to redefine terms, right? That that mean something completely different. Um, you know, and to in this specifically, right? So to to try to replace racism with the word discrimination, you know, completely ignores that that there is a systemic problem, right? And it puts it back on individuals, um, you know, doing things doing things wrong, and and that's that's just not quite the case. In fact, that completely undermines the 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 entire movement and energy behind this. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's good to know that this is even happening because again, that's a certain threat I didn't even realize was happening. Um, you know, um, I, and, I, and I want to, I want to go back to um, some of the declaration stuff and, and Councilman Jones, I want to come back to you on this, um, you know, in, in creating or, or, or passing this, this declaration, um, you know, racism as a public health crisis, what were, you know, what, what was the desired impact and, and, and specific? And I know we've, we've kind of touched on that a little bit and each of you kind of touched on it in, in your responses. 
Um, but I want to know specifically, you know, what was the desired impact as it relates to things like housing, you know, employment, uh, prisons, schools, you know, healthcare, right? Is it like, hey, we have this declaration, but how are we going to use this? Or how is it, what was the, the expectation on how it was going to be used to in, impact these different spaces? Right. Would somebody say, hey, this is this is going wrong over here. Um, but hey, we have this declaration that that racism is a public health crisis. And, you know, under the auspice of this, you know, we need to talk about these things or we need to, to make some changes. Right. Like like can you walk us through a little bit on what the expectations were. Right. I appreciate the question. Uh, I, I've been in office for 10 years and I, I've tried to fight the, the, the fight in, in every area where I saw it. Um, again, over 10 years with this declaration and with Eddie, uh, lead, again, leading our, our, our citizens um, council, uh, it's about one, again, recognizing it, acknowledging it, and then drawing up a strategy of how we address it. How do we resist it, again, resist it and, 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 and make a truthful change to, to the system. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to have your eyes on everything. But that's, that's what we're called to do. And uh, when it comes to those areas that you mentioned, whether it's housing, uh, with the, the human services world, uh, our, our, our county jail, uh, racism is a significant factor in, in everything. And, and how do we do it? I, I always start with, let's, let's acknowledge it. Let's recognize where it is. When someone spots it, then let's find a way. Let's, let's do what we need to do to change it. Um, I've seen it in many areas, whether it's contracting, workforce, apprenticeships, uh, uh, the human services world. It's there. Uh, we just need our, our, our committee that was birthed out of this, uh, out of this declaration. When, when they see something, they bring it to us, let our council know. And we, it's something we can address. It, it's, it's a daunting task. It can be overwhelming. We don't want people to be fatigued in it. I always say as African American, I have no choice but to stay in the fight. <laughs> but we don't want anyone to be fatigued in, in, the, in the work. And it's challenging. And, and uh, I ask those in the commission to continue to communicate. My door is always open so that if, when you feel something is not going, we don't, people have lives to live and they are sacrificing their time to be a part of, a, a part of this. And, and if they were to feel it was not being productive, I'd like to know. Before people start to, to drift off and just leave, I want to know. And maybe it's something we can do to, to, to fix it because it is a daunting task. And sometimes you're not, and the county is in no way perfect. Uh, and, and, but if, if we communicate, then there are ways that may, I'm sure there are ways where we can address and make sure we're being effective because the fight doesn't end. It's just do, do we get uh, weary and well doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, and that takes me to, you know, a question I want to throw back at Eddie and Danielle on this, um, you know, and, and, and similar, similar questions, but from a community standpoint, right, what, what types of things do you expect? To, like, did you expect to see, you know, when the declarations first come out versus, you know, what you still want to see, um, you know, happen as a, as a result? I mean, we're in the early uh, phases of the work that has to happen as a result. And I think that, um, unfortunately, yes, a lot of emphasis will get put on the fact that we've made a declaration. To me, it does not mean that we haven't already been working on these issues and will continue to work on the issues. And because they are embedded into so many systems, uh, it, it's, not a, it's not something that happens overnight in terms of we made a declaration and poof, magic, you know, everything is fixed because we've made the public declaration, but it does put us uh, again on watch and on notice and it arms, in my opinion, the community with more power, similar to what uh, Senator Williams said and, you know, um, County Council President Purnell Jones is the way that our government is set up, we do have to have definitive things. They could not make any policies at the county level relative to procurement that were race specific until the disparity study was done to prove that race neutral policies did not get at closing the disparities uh, and gaps. And so as a citizen, it feels frustrating when you're experiencing these things every day and you're like, well, duh, I'm living in this environment. I know that the, uh, there are disparities in terms of procurement, but the way our, our uh, charters are set up, 
it requires us to do a certain thing. And so again, I think that it, it can be frustrating to say, why does it feel like we're kind of just going through the motions, but we're not, we're using all of the tools available to us, all the tools at our disposal to try and attack these problems. So the declaration, in my opinion, is just one more tool that we have as everyday average citizens, as leaders, as members of the community to work towards eradicating our systems to make our communities more equitable and live up to what America espouses to be is this country where we all have the ability uh, in a democratic you know, way to participate in economic opportunity and other things. I think that response is, is spot on and as we bring it closer to home. When the work of the Citizens Advisory Council got started, we divided it, that work into four subcommittees. And one was on the criminal justice system. And as we've talked before, health and healthcare, equitable quality of life uh, was one of those subcommittees and then uh, economic opportunity. And we wrapped that all around, uh, wrapped it with a communication schedule. What we also done is interview, um, tens, probably nearly 50 people within the county, from the county executive to the chief of staff to uh, the head of the courts, uh, the prosecutor's office, folks who run HR, individuals who run connected agencies to the county, our housing authorities, because we wanted to get to what Danielle was talking about, right? How do we enjoin a whole number of folks into this conversation? And through some of their own admissions, indicated that racism, even if they were folks of who, who, were, who were white, some of their own admissions that, oh, when ex discussed and explained in this way, we can see that there are areas that are, a bit, that are a bit problematic. So we talk about the community involvement, important, but we also dealt with the things that we could control in some ways at home. And those have proved effective as well. So we talk about new strategies, well, that was a, that was an inspection, if you will, into the daily, the daily work, the daily decision making. And we had, again, honest conversations with folks. They didn't say what they said out of guilt. They acknowledged that, oh, there might be a new or different way of looking at how we've always gone about business. And ultimately, and I've explained it this way from the beginning, how we interact with our customers, right? The county as a government has customers, right? That's all the citizens who live within the county and are affected by the work of the county. And if we want to extend that good work and grace to everyone, well, it had to start uh, by examining our own internal efforts. And between our work and a commission that the county created, an internal commission, that is what's been done. And it has had some legs. It has sort of extended itself beyond just uh, the internal efforts. You know, and to, to the extent that, that these policies, declarations, et cetera, are effective and, and have been effective in other places um, and, and hopefully effective here, um, you know, what things, you know, can, can people be doing in their respective roles um, to, to create similar, you know, similar policies or similar declarations in, in other areas, right? So, you know, if there's a there's something with the county, right? There's something with the city, but then you have all these other respective municipalities or other counties, et cetera. You know, how important is it or is it important to to get other, you know, governmental entities on board with with something similar? Like how much impact do you think that can have? I think the impact can be tremendous. I, I mean, I grew up in business that said, uh, what gets measured gets attended to. And so if you don't define something, if you don't require that somebody is watching and paying attention to it, it's out of sight, it's out of mind. And again, when we think about uh, racism in, in a systemic way, if it is not impacting you directly day to day, it's really easy to not acknowledge or even take the time and energy to try and investigate um, if you have anything in your systems, in your policies, that are preventing folks from having the same, you know, access. And so I think that the more organizations that make a commitment, it, again, it gives people inside the organization another item and another tool to hold people accountable. Um, it requires in, in a lot of spaces that somebody at a higher level of leadership 
has to be accountable to either external or internal stakeholders around what's happening since that declaration has been made. And I think we're seeing that now, even with the Adams Board. I think that they are, to uh, Eddie's point, doing great work. But when they came out and made their statement and their declaration around racism as a public health crisis as well, now people are paying attention. And so we're saying, well, what are you going to do as a result of it? Just like they've said to members of the working group of the racism as a public health crisis for the city and for the county. And so I think the more organizations who definitively put down, just like any other mission, vision, or value statement, somebody now has the ability to hold you accountable. And really, I don't think any of these things work if we don't have citizen involvement, just like anything else. We need people that take the time to say, because you've made the declaration, these are the changes we expect you to, to make in your organization or in your government agency or wherever that space might be. Mm -hmm. Eddie, Councilman Jones, anything to add? I, I totally agree. Danielle said it very well. Every government at every level, every stakeholder in the community, every community organization should make the declaration. If you make that de declaration, I, I, I used the illustration earlier, I just call it a, having a spirit of the North because you must draw a Mason-Dixon line against what I'm gonna call a spirit of the South. And you must draw a line against it, make the declaration, resist it, and you build enough momentum. And, and everyone needs to be on the same side in this thing. And, and it starts with making that declaration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, one thing I do wanna do before we, you know, before we close as well, I, I'd love for, for each of you to share a little bit, you know, I know you guys are in, involved in so many different things, but with your respective roles, you know, if you can kind of speak to, you know, what your you know, communities or, or excuse me, uh, committees, organizations, et cetera, are doing that people can get involved in to help out with. So, you know, what things are happening with, with, with CASE that might be important for people to know, what things are happening with the NAACP, um, with, with county council as it relates to, as it relates to these issues. And, and I also will speak to that as it relates to Norman S. Minor Bar Association. I know I had a question that came in directly for me as well. So, um, so I want to give us all an opportunity to, to speak on what our organizations are doing um, and how people can, can be involved. Um, so let's see, uh, Councilman Jones, if you want to take that. Part. I'm sorry, Delante, did you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is just, you know, what, what things are our council, you know, does council have going on or anything coming down the pipeline um, that, that, that people should know about? I uh, should know about just in terms of um, battling racism. Uh, we, in time, we have an additional contract on closing the achievement gap as the educational program um, where we are mentoring children in our local high school. At risk youth who are dropping out, uh, racism is always uh, uh, in, in the air around uh, our education. And what this mentor does is mentor children who, have, uh, who are at risk. Uh, challenges at home, whether social, emotional, whatever those might be that are preventing them from learning two plus two equals four. And by engaging these youth, we help them stay in school and eventually graduate. We take them to, to, to uh, movies, bowling, they take them to college tours to have them thinking about college in four years. This program has been going on for eight years and we look to see it continue to grow and expand across high schools. It is about, again, closing that educational gap and helping them succeed. When I started it eight years ago, it was my hope in four years to give out proclamations uh, and uh, acknowledge our youth and their success. But I had a graduation class in the third year. And the reason was because we had targeted at-risk youth and unbeknownst to us, because they had failed maybe the third grade or the eighth grade, when we engaged them in ninth through 12th, they actually recovered their proper school credit and they graduated on time after three years. That was huge. We had 33 children out of about 200 that were in the initiative across four school, four local high schools. 33 graduated on time. So from that third year on to this year, we have continued to engage our youth, uh, again, help them to be successful. And, and, and it is a way of addressing those societal outcomes or impacts and having a positive outcome of increasing attendance and, and increasing graduation, reducing suspensions and reducing dropouts. 
making sure that our children are being successful. So, so my mission is to continue to see this initiative expand across many more school systems. We're in about eight schools right now and, and looking to expand more wherever. You find African-American children, you will find an educational gap as measured by the state in a failing school system that is tied directly to the, the number of African-American children you find in a school system. So that is where the gap is and that is where uh, the front lines of racism are and, and um, our, our efforts are, are, are bearing fruit in that respect. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Eddie, any thoughts on, on uh, things specific that, that CASE is working on or are coming down the pipeline? Well, so yes, CASE in just a moment. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, the first thing is sort of folks can engage these discussions in their own firms and their own practices uh, in their own circles, right? And, and where there are struggles to have these meaningful conversations certainly reach out. We, this isn't a day job for uh, me or Danielle. This is stuff we do because we believe it's right. We have passion around it. Uh, maybe in some ways a day job for Danielle, uh, but passion around it. The other thing is the case is a citizens advisory council. So if you have a question, join in the monthly dialogues that we have. You know, you can join online virtually. You can even show up at the council, the uh, council's meetings, uh, you can write in, as Danielle mentioned, uh, in terms of the NAACP uh, response to the Adams board, but just, just get in the game as much as anything else, if you have an interest in knowing more, learning more, doing more. Same, and I would say, uh, this is not my, my day job. I do have a full-time job outside of the uh, NAACP and, um, it is something that I think that all of us have the ability to lend our time, talent, and treasure, you know, to advocacy. And so opportunities to get engaged around this work. Um, I think that there are, we, we've got over, you know, 18 committees at the NAACP and, and focused and led by members of our association. It's $30 to become a member of the NAACP. Anybody that wants to join can go on our website, you know, and do that, clevelandnaacp.org. Um, we invite folks to, to join us in the work and because we don't have, again, a, a special cape or badge that allows us to just make all these things go away. It is literally the power and the voice of people that causes change to happen in communities and organizations. And so if there are issues that folks feel like the NAACP could do a better job on or take on, uh, really most of the challenge is having enough interested people to lead an effort. There are plenty of things in our community that we identify every day as challenges and we see those things become addressed. I look at the Lead, uh, Lead Safe Coalition. That was a community-led effort that ended up partnering with uh, legislators at city council to eventually get something to happen. And now we have uh, corporations or, or hospital systems that are looking at setting aside millions of dollars towards an effort that started as a grassroots community you know, type of initiative. So there's always work to do. There are things that we're continuing to do at the NACP. If there's anything you're interested in, I'm sure we can find a space uh, and let you put your shoulder to the plow to do some work alongside of us. No, thank you, Danielle. You know, and, and I say this all the time, you know, there, there are enough causes for everyone, right? And, you know, whatever it is that you're passionate about, whatever little piece of, of this, of this larger problem, um, you know, or issue there, there is something to, to be done. And so as it relates to the Norman S. Minor Bar Association, right, we're, we're an organization of, of legal professionals and, and, you know, I personally believe it's important for us to, to play our part in that. And that includes, that includes partnership, that includes, you know, being at the forefront uh, of these issues that, that many of our, our members or our, the legal community, you know, have, have seats at tables. And so, you know, the, uh, I'm certainly proud of the organization, um, you know, as we have been, you know, really vocal in, in certain issues as it relates to diversity in, in our courts and, um, you know, and, and you know, criminal justice, sentencing, and, and, and so many other issues. Um, you know, specifically, one of, one of my goals and, and our goals as a, as a board and as an organization is to, you know, really be a stronger resource for, for our community, you know, especially as we turn the corner or hopefully turn a corner of this pandemic that, that has, you know, left 
so so many of us, uh, so many of our people, um, you know, in, in in bad situations, when you know, as it relates to housing and employment, and and you know, lots of different things. And so, so we want to make sure that we're a resource there. You know, we we've, we've already started having conversations, um, <clears throat> you know, with with the NAACP to work out, you know, how we can. You know how we can do that. You know we get we get calls all the con time from just you know everyday citizens, and I think both organizations we do. I know the NAACP does as well. That says, hey, you know I've been discriminated at work at work, or you know, hey, I just lost my job, or I just lost my house, or you know, I got turned away from this, or I've been a victim of of, of some you know type of crime. Where can I go? What can I do? You know, and so we are actively working together to figure out how to streamline processes to be able to actually address these issues, you know, as opposed to, to letting them, you know, kind of kind of flutter away. And so in doing that just as an organization, but then also, you know, connecting with, you know, the, the many attorneys and, and professionals that that do do this work as a day job. Right. So, you know, similar to Danielle and Eddie, it's also not my day job. Um, but but at the same time, there there are people who this is their day job, right? And so we want to make sure that that we're all working together to to address these issues. And you know, these conversations are certainly part of it. But you know, I, I certainly intend to you know walk the beaten path just as much as as we're talking about it. Uh, you know, if 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 not more. Um, so that being said, we are uh, just at two minutes over 1.30. Um, on behalf of the Norman S. Minor Bar Association and the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, we certainly appreciate uh, you know, all, of, all of the attendees for, for being here, for being a part of the conversation. We hope that you took something with it, if not for anything else, a, a renewed energy to have these conversations in your respective spaces. Um, thank you, of course, to our panelists, uh, Councilman Jones, uh, Eddie Taylor, Daniel Sidner, I really appreciate your time. For being here. Um, I'll toss it back to, to Pega um, now as well for some final uh, housekeeping and closing things. Thanks so much, Delante, uh, Mr. Taylor, President Jones, and Danielle. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, yeah, I said Mr. Taylor, I said Danielle. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> um, thank you. And uh, of course, our thanks to Senator Williams, who had to log off. Um, I wanted to make sure that everyone who is watching this program for the purpose of continuing legal education or CLE credit knows that there will be a survey sent to you uh, shortly after the conclusion of our program here today. It's important that you fill that survey out and that way we can file your credits with the Supreme Court of Ohio. On behalf of the CMBA, thank you and I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon.